Okay. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, Kelsey. Okay. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, attending this one this afternoon and uh, earlier presentations this morning. At uh, stormwater, something I've been working on for a couple decades, and so it's uh, very important to me. And I think this all you'll see this presentation um, come together, sort of tie in, uh, just justify some of the work we all do and and and, and why we do it. Um, I apologize for not getting a real body um, because this is so popular. This is like, this is real, the latest, greatest science because we knew something was killing fish, pre-spawning mortality. Not only the adults coming in ready to lay their eggs, couldn't get that done, but juveniles. And so this is really pretty amazing science that they actually drilled down right to the one thing that David mentioned, the 6 PVDQ quinone is, is the culprit. And it's an additive in tires. Well, I won't. I won't take too much away. I'll let you watch this. But I think. I think it's going to be a little mind blowing for you. Um, I've seen this presentation. So what we're going to do? They're going to show the video. Then I'm going to hang on after the video, and I'll try to answer questions. I'm certainly not the scientist, but I have seen the presentation directly from Jen McIntyre. And so then, and any questions that I have to follow up for, I'll be happy to do that. Um, if that, Jen's with the Washington Stormwater Center. Um, at Washington State University and her, her cohort, Heidi Siegelbaum, has helped with this. So some of you might know that group, or I know like David, he's part of an advisory group and some of us. But anyhow, I think this is going to be pretty eye-opening to you. It's about 38 minutes, and then I think we will just stop. Rather than do the questions and answers that were on the video, this attachment's here, or we'll just have a discussion afterwards and do some brainstorming. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Kelsey, to go ahead and start showing the video, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of MuniCon. I'm Lori Larson with the Washington Stormwater Center, and I had the privilege of working with an amazing, dedicated team of municipal staff to plan this conference. I hope you've enjoyed the first two days. Take a look at the announcements in the lobby. Today, we're going to acknowledge that amazing team, and it would be great for you all to know who they are. Today, our speaker is Dr. Jennifer McIntyre. She's an associate professor of toxicology, aquatic toxicology at Washington State University and works with the Washington Stormwater Center. Her focus is on science that affects change and she has a history of affecting change. She is responsible for the ban of a pulp mill affluent used as road dust present. Uh, she worked with, her research was used by the Washington Department of Health to issue a fish consumption advisory for Lake Washington. And her legislation in Washington and California was used to phase out copper brake pads. Today, she's gonna to share her most recent research with us, where the rubber meets the road, tire chemicals in the toxicology of stormwater. Jen, please take it away. All right, good morning, everybody. Nice and bright and early. Hope this will be a good start to your MuniCon day. Uh, I first wanna acknowledge the research partners and funders who've contributed to and supported um, my research over the years. Um, and today I'll, I'll be talking about an issue that I particularly wanna make sure to acknowledge the work of Ed Kalaje and his team at uh, the University of Washington Tacoma, as I'll be, I'll be featuring that shared work that, that we published in Science at the end of the year. So I wanna start off with um, sharing the context that we live in a chemical world. Um, in the United States, we have about 83,000 chemicals um, that are used commercially and they are regulated under the Toxic, Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, an additional over 2,000 chemicals are used as pesticides and they're regulated under FIFRA. And roadway runoff alone contains thousands of unique chemicals. And this is just, um, that number is just coming from looking at a subset of even organic chemicals. So in addition to that, we have all of the metals and the other um, non-organics. So very chemical complicated world that we live in, but, but that's okay, right? Because we have regulations in place to protect ourselves and aquatic animals <clears throat> from these chemicals. We have the Clean Water Act, which is des designed to protect waterways <clears throat> from the discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts. 
And then we have state water quality standards that are guided by these federal regulations that are designed to provide water quality for the protection and propagation of fish among other uses. And among these state water quality standards, we have aquatic life criteria. Um, and what these do is designate concentrations of chemicals that are allowed in surface waters without harming aquatic species is, is the idea behind those. And of course, we regulate stormwater runoff, and we do this because we value healthy ecosystems. That's why we have these regulations in place. The direct benefits to us are clean water, clean food, clean air. And then there are the indirect benefits to us of having healthy food webs as a whole. So how do we regulate stormwater? Well, we use chemistry. We use these, um, these rules and regulations about chemical concentrations that are allowed in surface waters. In Washington state, we have aquatic life criteria for about 31 chemicals. Um, and most of these are metals and pesticides. And under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, we have permits that set numerical limits for a small number of pollutants that are in stormwater runoff, right? I mean, you, you folks know about this. So <clears throat> um, my rhetorical question is whether our current stormwater regulations are sufficient to protect aquatic ecosystems. And to highlight, uh, to highlight this mismatch, I'm going to somewhat briefly summarize a mystery that my research group um, has, has recently solved in collaboration with, with many partners. <clears throat> so the story started about 20 years ago when a group of Seattle area researchers noticed that coho salmon returning to spawn in um, urban streams were behaving abnormally after it rained, right? Uh, notably, this was at many of the area creeks, uh, at one of the many area creeks that had had a uh, complete makeover in terms of habitat restoration. Um, the uh, restorations wanted to know would, you know, if they rebuilt it, would the fish come? And in fact, they did. And adult salmon were again observed using these systems. But these otherwise healthy looking fish were dead within hours of these abnormal behaviors. Researchers led by NOAA Fisheries and US Fish and Wildlife Service at the time began studying the issue and they found that the phenomenon was both widespread and is both widespread and recurrent. Uh, and the symptomatic fish were displaying um, a variety of behaviors including surface swimming, gaping at the surface, disorientation and a loss of equilibrium. And this led to high rates of mortality that can include the, the entire run, especially in systems that aren't receiving a lot of spawners. So population modeling subsequently by NOAA fisheries researchers demonstrated that even modest rates of this pre-spawning mortality would be expected to lead to local extirpations, to local extinctions of populations. So this mortality was not explained by temperature, by dissolved oxygen, um, by by you know, things that we regularly do regulate by um, the presence of pathogens or commonly measured toxic chemicals for which we have aquatic life criteria. Um, although we did find evidence of exposure to common pollutants like metals and hydrocarbons, the concentrations that we measured um, both in the water and in the tissues did not appear sufficient to explain this mortality. Instead, instead the weight of evidence pointed towards the influx of stormwater runoff into these systems. And as you know, in developed landscapes, we don't get that infiltration taking place because of the impervious area that's, that's involved. Um, and, and that runoff picks up and moves with it a, um, a lot of chemicals so that by the time it reaches um, surface waters, it's, it's pretty polluted. So what is it about stormwater that is killing the coho? Right? That's the mystery that we had set out to solve you know, years and years and years ago. After our initial results documenting um, rates of mortality in about seven Seattle area creeks, um, more extensive spawning surveys were conducted to understand um, how widespread the phenomenon was. So local municipalities, tribal nations, and nonprofit groups all contributed information from more than 50 basins around Puget Sound that enabled this uh, extensive land use analysis by NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that allowed them to predict rates of mortality for coho salmon um, from 
from um, this phenomenon throughout the Puget Sound region. So that's what this map is. And not surprisingly, um, the higher rates of predicted mortality are coinciding with the more developed basins, right? Obviously all of the red around Seattle and also Tacoma and even up in Bellingham. Um, so the, high, the higher rates of mortality were, were not more broadly associated with development though. What was interesting is that the, they, the higher rates of mortality were correlated most strongly <clears throat> with uh, roads, with the presence of roads and with busier roads um, and more dense traffic. So that led us to study, uh, to focus in particular on what roadway runoff. So about 10 years ago, uh, we began to study roadway runoff during rain events. Um, and uh, we began to expose aquatic animals directly to this runoff to start to understand what it might be doing to those animals when it entered receiving waters. And we found that by experimentally exposing adult coho salmon to roadway runoff, that we were able to recreate the acute changes in behavior and uh, the pre-spawning mortality that we were seeing in urban creeks. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen these videos already. So through various experiments then, we've seen that this affects not just the adult spawners, but it also affects, um, uh, experimentally, we can see that it affects juvenile coho. They are also sensitive and also recently hatched alevin. And also that very little runoff is needed to cause this acute mortality. Um, runoff collected from different storm events produces similar levels of toxicity. Um, and essentially 100% mortality at 25 or greater percent runoff in the experiments we've done um, and significant mortality even at, uh, even at just 5% runoff. So coho are somewhat uniquely sensitive to stormwater runoff among Pacific salmon that we have studied, uh, but there is a gradient in sensitivity among these species that we've tested. We found that steelhead and chinook um, are the next most sensitive species of Pacific salmon and that sockeye appear unaffected similar to chum. And I wanna point out here that we're talking about really overt toxicity, right? We're talking about um, rapid onset mortality really. So even though we've looked at blood parameters in the adult salmon study that we did um, in juveniles, you know, we were only looking at mortality. And so it is likely that there are sublethal effects um, that we need to be concerned about with these other species um, and also with coho exposed to sublethal concentrations. All right, so what is it in road runoff that is lethal to coho? This was not an easy question to answer. Um, urban stormwater runoff is very chemically complex. I mentioned the thousands of chemical unique organic chemicals that um, Ed Kalaje's postdoc Bowen Du reported on a few years ago. Um, Kathy Peter, another postdoc with Ed Kalaje, um, started to explore the identity of some of those chemicals and found that many of, even, even many of the ones that were identifiable uh, were not necessarily toxicologically characterized. We didn't necessarily know how, what their impacts would be on aquatic organisms. And then finally, the chemicals that we regulate in stormwater <laughs> don't appear to be causing this observed toxicity. Uh, mixtures that we have made of metals and hydrocarbons, even at, even at higher concentrations than you would find in stormwater runoff, um, do not elicit these symptoms and do not elicit, do not cause mortality even uh, in, these, in these acute short-term exposures. So instead of sorting through all of the chemicals in this, this crazy soup, uh, we started to study the sources of chemicals to roadway runoff. Uh, we know that they're coming from particles. They're coming from particles worn from tires, particles in exhaust, uh, particles coming off of our brake friction materials, um, and also the fluids that come out of our vehicles, things like windshield washer fluid and all the things that leak out of our vehicles. So we looked at the chemical similarity of these different vehicle sources to uh, comparing that chemical uh, complexity to the, these waters that we know can kill coho. Um, so samples of roadway runoff and samples of urban, urban receiving waters, urban creek waters during storm events. So among 75 non-target organic chemicals, um, 
tire particles of, of the vehicle sources, tire particles stood out as being most chemically similar to these waters that kill cocoa. Um, and this means that, that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of the same chemicals that are in stormwater uh, or in tire coming off of tire particles dominate the, the, that chemical soup of roadway runoff. It does not necessarily mean that that would be the source of the toxicant that's killing the coho. Um, so we conducted further experiments to determine that, um, to determine the question of whether tires would, are the source of this acute toxicity to coho. So we know that stormwater, that roadway runoff is acutely lethal to coho, does not appear to affect chum. Uh, and when coho gets sick, they show elevated um, hematocrit, that's the HCT, uh, and reduced concentrations in their plasma of ions and also reduced pH. So through a series of experiments, we showed that each of these was also the case for chemicals that were leaching into water from tire particles. So in fact, yes, the tires did appear to be the source of this acute toxicity to coho salmon. Now to isolate the responsible toxicant, we paired toxicology exposures with high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, this was the, the work, um, the chemistry was the work done by Ed Kalaji and, and his team. The, um, this analytical technique essentially detects all of the organic chemicals um, present in a water sample. And it tells you that different chemicals are there. You learn the mass and the retention time of those chemicals, but it does not tell you what the chemicals are. Right? That requires additional sleuthing. So we made a tire leachate by recirculating water through um, particles worn off of the tread of tires. Um, and we did this leaching for 24 hours. And then we fractionated the leachate to reduce its chemical complexity. Okay, And so initially we did this by filtering the leachate through sand to remove any particle bound chelations. Um, we used uh, chelation to remove metals from the water sample. And then the subsequent steps I'll show you on the next slide. So we exposed coho to um, each of these fractions. And so we were using them as a screening tool to track the toxicity. Uh, the fraction that killed coho still contained our unknown toxicant. So then through high resolution mass spec, we tried to identify the chemicals that were present in that fraction. And we also continued to reduce the chemical complexity by further fractionation. So this approach did work. Um, our initial leachate contained more than 2,000 chemicals over here. And each fractionation step resulted in one toxic and several non-toxic fractions. So that's the red being the toxic fraction that continues on through this sequence. And then the blues not causing toxicity, we didn't, we didn't continue to study. So, so through this approach, we were able to sequentially reduce the chemical complexity down to just four chemicals, a toxic fraction that contained just four chemicals. Uh, and this final fraction was dominated by a compound with the formula of C18, H22, and 2O2. Um, and this was present in the leachate at about 30 micrograms per liter. But what was this chemical? <clears throat> NMR later confirmed the structure of the chemical, which I'm showing you here, but we still didn't know what it was. Um, it did not appear to be a known ingredient in tires um, based on, on the literature. Uh, Zhen Yutian, who's, who's the lead, um, the lead uh, fractionation mastermind on this project, he made the association between this unknown um, C18, H22, and 2O2, and the anti-ozonant 6-PPD um, that is used in tires, it is an ingredient in tires and it has the same number of carbons and nitrogens, whereas oxygens and hydrogens can change when, when oxidation and reduction occur with chemicals. Um, so based on this, this very good hunch, um, the team purchased industrial grade 6-PPD, uh, you know, just just purchased a commercial source from a commercial source. And then through ozonation, uh, they produced a mixture of chemicals, um, of transformation products from the ozonation uh, that included the unknown chemical, right? So here's the um, ozonation sequence that in fact did lead to this unknown chemical, which we now call 6-PPD quinone. So subsequent to that, uh, we used toxicology screening again to validate that this was our toxicant. 
um, and that 6-PPD was the parent compound. So 6-PPD, the first two lines of this table, produce little to no acute uh, mortality, uh, whereas the ozonated 6-PPD, that O3 mix, and the purified, um, sorry, oh, yeah, ozonated 6-PPD, which contains 6-PPD quinone, and then the purified 6-PPD quinone, whether it was purified, <coughs> purified from that ozonation mix or whether it was purified from our tire leachate, um, those were acutely lethal. <clears throat> to explore the environmental relevance of the toxicant, we examined uh, mortality curves uh, for dilutions of roadway runoff and tire leachates, this top panel here, on the basis of their quinone concentration. So just looking at the concentration of quinone in those samples, we determined that a, um, if that's what's driving the toxicity in these complex mixtures, it's uh, the median lethal concentration for that, for that quinone present in those samples was about 0.8 micrograms per liter. <clears throat> so in panel B, we have the dose response relationship for just the purified quinone. <clears throat> and the LC50 for the purified quinone was essentially the same. So this suggested that the toxicity of the more complex chemical mixtures um, of tire, the tire leachate and the roadway runoff that they could be explained by the concentration of quinone that they contained. So this led us to conclude that in fact, 6-PPD quinone is the primary causal toxicant of the acute mortality in coho. We also showed that 6-PPD quinone is present above lethal concentrations uh, in all roadway runoff samples that we analyzed. Um, additionally, in six out of seven stream samples from Seattle taken around the timing of mortality events for coho, uh, we found that the concentration of quinone was near or above that median lethal concentration that we had determined in the lab. <clears throat> and finally, that, that this quinone was detected in runoff or receiving waters from a variety of, of locations that um, were included in the study. Um, and so this encouraged us to conclude that, that we would expect to find 6-PBD quinone anywhere where there are tires <laughs> and therefore tire rubber particles. So I want to add a few more pieces about this, um, about this relationship with the tires. So ground level ozone, which is a ubiquitous air pollutant, particularly where there are vehicles being, combustion engines being used, um, uh, ozone is continually attacking the surface of tires. So the way that the anti-ozonants work is that they slowly migrate to the tire surface throughout the life of the tire. Um, and then the ozone reacts first with this anti-ozonant rather than with the tire polymers. Uh, without the 6-PPD in this case, <clears throat> the surface of the tire cracks as ozone and other oxidants break down those tire polymer bonds, bonds between tire polymers. Um, when the ozone reacts with 6-PPD, we know, now know that it's transformed into 6-PPD quinone and, and a few other chemicals. Um, and in fact, this change is what's responsible for the brown coloration that tires get. And you particularly see that on the sidewall because on the tread, it's continually being worn off, right? By actually driving. Um, and there's all sorts of products on the market to help your brownish tires become shiny and black again, which of course washes off the 6-PPD quinone. Because um, the point I wanna make here is that, is that 6-PPD quinone is already present in the surface of the tire and that this quinone can leach directly from the tire surface in addition to from those worn particles wherever they may be. All right, so what can we do about this problem? Um, it's, uh, it's clear that simply following existing regulations for protecting aquatic life um, from chemicals is not sufficient. So what, what can we do? Um, one solution that we are pursuing is um, talking with uh, U.S. tire manufacturers uh, about whether there are safer alternatives to that parent compound, to 6-PPD as the anti-ozonant in tires. Um, we've also been talking with groups like Salmon Safe about um, incentives and marketing opportunities for tires that are in fact Salmon Safe. So that's a, a very exciting um, option for a solution that we're looking forward to, but that solution may take some time. So in the meantime, we already do have a robust set of solutions in our toolbox in um, green stormwater infrastructure. Uh, as you likely know, researchers at the Washington Stormwater Center have been studying various uh, GSI for, for going on a decade now. 
And despite not knowing what the re responsible chemicals were for the coho pre-spawn mortality phenomenon, we have shown that bioretention filtration can prevent the acute lethal effect of roadway runoff on coho salmon. So with support from um, various organizations and institutions, including the stormwater action monitoring, uh, we have also shown that this is true for um, adult coho, in addition to adult coho, also for juveniles and for alevin. Um, it can also prevent many of the sublethal effects that we see have seen in developing fish. And retrospective analysis of the non-target organic chemicals um, by, by Ed's group has indicated that 6-PPD quinone is undetectable in the effluent of these experimental bioretention systems that we've worked on together. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't done too many, but the ones for which we had these um, archived samples, we don't see it in the effluent, although it's present in the influent. <clears throat> and we've also worked with federal highways and, um, and Washington State Department of Transportation on um, a BMP effectiveness project with compost amended bioswales, which treat runoff adjacent to highways. And uh, again, with using retrospective analysis, we see that 6-PPD quinone was removed at very high rates from um, the roadway runoff that was being treated by these, uh, by these bioswale systems. What else do we have? Um, uh, we can and should, of course, develop additional aquatic life criteria, not just for this 6-PPD quinone, but for toxicants that may be, you know, different toxicants that may be driving the toxicity that we see for other relevant species, even if it's less overt and obvious than the toxicity we see with the coho salmon. But we could also be letting the aquatic animals tell us whether these waters are safe. Um, we, could, we could require toxicity testing batteries to, to screen for um, the integrated toxicity that happens with complex environmental samples instead of the, the one by one chemical approach that we currently use. So concluding thoughts on, on this research that thread um, include that, that tires are, are a, a source of very complex chemical mixtures that end up in the air and in the water. And we're starting to recognize that, that some of these are um, definitely chemicals of concern. Um, we are going to need both GSI and source controls, I think, to solve this problem. And uh, finally, I. I want you to be thinking about uh, the chemicals that we put into our products. Um, this is another area where, where we can be making changes. So a lot of, so sometimes chemicals are designed to be reactive, like the 6-PPD, like the anti So it's, it's really important that we start to understand better um, what transformation products result from those chemicals that are added um, in order to react on purpose with, with, with various um, things. So, um, we need to be asking whether there are safer alternatives to those chemicals. And I just want to end up here with a couple calls to action. So I want to reinforce the importance of existing campaigns to reduce uh, water and air pollution, right? Things like good vehicle maintenance. So in addition to, um, you know, making sure our vehicles aren't dripping and leaking, um, um, also uh, making sure that they have um, sufficient air pressure in the tires because that will help reduce the wear on the tires, which will help reduce the amount of chemical getting into our surface waters. Um, obviously the, the washing the car on the um, pavements and letting that water get into our, um, our, our stormwater conveyance systems, uh, particularly cleaning those tires and making them shiny and black again, um, not to be not to be done. And finally, the idea of driving less, um, uh, which includes telecommuting. And so COVID is sort of being a help with that for, <laughs> for a lot of people anyhow. Um, helps us prevent the pollution that comes from our vehicles anyhow um, and gets into our waterways. So we may have time for a question or we may not, but that is the end of this presentation. Thank you. Jen, we have one minute left. Um, and we have a flood of questions. So I'm going to ask if I can send you these questions and you can provide written responses that we can post on the website with the recorded presentation. Sure thing. Great. I, I want to thank you, Jennifer. This has been fabulous information. And 
you've given us a lot to think about, but not just what's going on and what you've discovered, but how we can take action. And I really appreciate you providing that information to us. And for the attendees, I will follow up with Jen. There are still a number of questions coming in and with only a few seconds left, we won't be able to answer them. But thank you again, Dr. Jennifer McIntyre, and we will follow up with you. All right, have a good day, everybody at the conference. All right. All right. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen here, and we'll just be the um, the two of us here. Bill, um, at this point, folks, Bill's going to help facilitate some questions and answers that were prompted. And as a reminder, we do have that handouts in the handouts box um, that you can take a peek at right now. This would be a good time to do that. Um, so they may help prompt some thoughts too, as well, uh, beyond uh, the presentation Jen gave. Yeah, yeah, definitely open. I don't know all the answers, but I thought, I hope that was uh, eye-opening to you all to see how cool it is that they're drilling right down to what's causing these mortalities. Um, I, the previous sun I saw showed a lot more video of the fish, of juveniles and adults, how they, when they get first in contact with that stormwater, they, they, they can't swim straight, they roll over, they're looking like they're grasping for air and, and it, it prevents their ability to absorb oxygen as part of uh, what they think is killing them. But uh, I think it was pretty amazing science that they got right to this source of, of what's causing it. And so um, I just, and we heard it, she pronounced it quinone and quinone. So that was a little bit earlier on David's question. We weren't sure how to, uh, pronounce it because I heard quiet pine on it. So um, that's good. So we, at least we know we're a little closing in on, on, so we can all refer to it and more intelligently when we're uh, talking in our circles and our watersheds and our groups. So anybody have any discussion things they want to just join in? I, uh, I have a particular question um, and maybe this can wait at the end, but maybe just to spark some discussions here when I was watching that, I was thinking about my district and um, you know, work that we do in various aspects of our programs to help address some of this kind of toxicology, um, whether it's like the drip and drive, that kind of campaign. I was curious to know if folks who are in the audience right now um, would be willing to like raise their hand and share a little bit of maybe some of the work that you're doing at your district to address some of that, just to get some ideas flowing. And I see Mar Margaret has a question mark on her name. Oh. Good. So Margaret, um, oh, the handout, Margaret. So um, in your, uh, so if folks are having difficulty um, with the handouts, it looks like Stephanie in the chat. Um, Steph, you may need to resend that to the all audience, not just to us organizers. Um, <laughs> Um, no problem. Um, but there's a tab, I believe, in your tab that there's a handouts in that little toolbar. Um, there's a little down arrow to the left of handouts, and it's a PDF you can click and download. And I believe Steph um, resent that link so everyone can see it. You can click on that too in the chat. Yep, right underneath the attendees is the next little drop down to handouts mm -hmm. one. Right. So. Yeah, so just if anyone is interested um, and willing, yeah, great. It looks like uh, Margaret got it. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, again, the message I heard is our bio, as David said, and what we learned, it's it's when that stormwater goes through a biosoil, it's specifically dirt, there was zero mortalities. So what I always, I bugged them a little bit about making sure they shared that message that there's a solution, because it, it's a little scary if you just send out a message that tires are killing fish and that. The fact that our, our bioretention, our rain gardens, all those things we do, um, it, it stops that and it fixes that. And so, so I think it, it's always good for us to reaffirm that what we're off there offering is, is right, is correct, is functioning. Right, right. Let's see, um, again, you can, you can pose questions in the questions box. Um, um, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, so those are a couple of different options. Again, if you're if you're somebody at your district who's doing some work that's tied in with this topic, I know that I think I would benefit 
from hearing um, about your projects um, as it relates to this topic, and I'm sure others would. So, you know, if you're interested in sharing and are willing to, that would be awesome. And maybe, Bill, is there work like at Skagit that you guys are doing that addresses some of this? I would imagine there's probably some work you or partners are doing in the Skagit River Delta. Well, we've, we've done, and David Jackson helped, we've done some rain gardens um, there in partnership with Snohomish Conservation District. One, one was, it wasn't on a roadside, but another one at a church um, that Derry Kahn described. We use the same tools for other applications actually in small scale agriculture, just running mm -hmm. it, through, allowing that water that chance, you slow it down, uh, like we saw in the stormwater wetlands, but it has a chance to infiltrate into the soils. And, you know, one, one concern always is, well, gosh, then you're having this stuff in the soils. Well, gosh, I'd rather have it in one spot, one point of infiltration that gets captured in the top, you know, so many inches of soils than continuing to run downstream and getting spread throughout an entire reach, sub basin or whatever. And especially if it stops and, and stops more, yeah, killing these fish that we spend so much time on our projects, also restoring fish habitat and all those things that go to to help with fish and then only to have them, you know, after they make that whole journey as juveniles out to the ocean, come back three years later to then to die as an adult with a belly full of eggs, it's just is a necessary thing. And, and that it's a, so important that we found this. So I, I do believe um, others are trying to, you know, we do have a vision to work with the cities and our stormwater to um, try to do retrofits of bioretention where we can, um, where the grounds, open and available um you know if you can do that you can do that with gravity too so it's be a gravity fed thing so i think that's something we can work with our with the cities that we partner with because it's generally urban obviously we need them in the rural but right uh, it's so any any time we can figure out ways to slow that water down as well like david when you get good vegetation or sedges even in a country ditch um something that's not cleaned out raw so it actually can slow the water down to soak in a little bit um, while still maintaining drainage is important, so. Right. We have a, a program and we're on Whidbey Island, so we don't have as many of those big riparian riverine systems as those of you on the mainland do, but even on Whidbey, because we're an island <laughs> surrounded um, by, by the, the sea, um, a lot of the work we're doing, at least my colleague Gwendolyn, um, who I can't claim any credit, she's the stormwater specialist. Um, she's working with partners um, with Snohomish CD and we're doing a, a, a rain garden kind of citizen science program where um, we're utilizing partnerships with WSU and others um, to train essentially the trainers who can go out and help provide assistance to landowners with evaluating the effectiveness of, of existing you know green infrastructure to make sure that, that that work that was put in, whether it was by the district or previous um, projects, private contractors, et cetera, are actually functioning um, to do what it was meant to do, which you know oftentimes you put those projects in the ground. It's that maintenance piece I know that David spoke about that's really important and and we forget about that. <laughs> Is it still functioning? Um, you know, that's the long-term goal. So um, even an island, like an island system that we have, where it's not maybe specifically a, a riparian area, but um, you know, if we have just even upland lots that have rain gardens and green infrastructure, having citizen science around that has been a real big hit for us, um, and our partners love it too. So that's just an instance for uh, from our district that I'm happy to share. Yeah, Anyone I, else interested? I, I, Don't be shy. Oh, it looks like, oh, that was, that was Margaret's. Remember, you can- one, one, Yeah, one, one thought came to mind, Kelsey, is just talking, and I see there's some educators on here as well as stormwater folks. Um, we might want to think about, you know, occasionally having some kind of a crossover meeting between the educator groups and the stormwater groups or habitat groups and educator just to share this new, oh, here's the latest, greatest, are you aware, are these, in, are, can we plug these into crossover between our different programs that we learn this, here's what we do. So at the same time we're educating, we're applying it and it could come from either end, right? There is no, you know, so I think that's that's a good, maybe it happens in the office, but maybe, I mean, some of our districts are pretty small, right? You got a couple people that wear five hats. And so mm -hmm. that might be of some benefit in some of those other groups to, to 
touch on these sometimes, figure out a, a good way to, to get those out. And maybe, I'm not sure, Any I'm open to ideas from folks who, where the hub would be, what, whether it is WACD hub or how, how we use that, what's the, what's the right place to make sure we're all on the same page sometimes. Yeah, folks are aware um, in your work of specific tools or references that you use and would be willing to share out. That would be great. I, I'm familiar with, and maybe any of you, it's been a while, um, but I do remember when I first started at our district, it was really helpful. WACD does have a, a district's kind of directory where um, if there's a particular program um, of emphasis at that district and WACD is informed of those programs, they'll they'll put that on a subpage of WACD's website so that you can go there and I'll see if I can find um, that particular link or maybe Steph <laughs> Stephanie, you can look while I'm over here. Um, but it's helpful because then it's by program area and you can um, you can click and there's I think stormwater and ag and all the you know the common um, district program areas but then it directs you to that that page of the website of that district so it helps start to connect you with people if you're new to the district community so that's something I can see about finding um, where that was I had a recent encounter with Tom about that so <laughs> I got to just remember where that link is. Yeah, yeah, that's great because I do believe it helps us justify um, why we do what we do. And and with our, if we're asking a landowner or a business to do something, here again, here's here's this is you know, if, especially if there's links to this kind of presentation, this is why we're asking you to do what you do and that it does work. And so we're not, it's not an experiment anymore. I mean, it's actually yeah. should work. And so. Um, yeah, and actually Steph just uh, put that up and let's see if I can get that so that you guys can see it on my end here. Again, I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning um, the share option here too. Um, so yeah, so this is on the, uh, the Washington Association of Conservation Districts, WACD. Um, for those of you new to our acronyms, uh, a lot of new staff I know, um, but this is the uh, the WACD, what we do, and then within that, um, you can see that they have it organized by different topic areas, and you can click on those topic areas. Now, within that, I'm pretty sure when I was on here, I think it's this district directory, I'm pretty sure. Um, let's see, you can kind of go along with me here. <laughs> I'll find it and I'll put it in here um, when I find it for you guys um, or send that out to the group because it is it was really helpful for me when I first started as a planner and outreach coordinator to find out what different programs each district did and that way I could focus my outreach to those staff members so um, they have it here and I will I will find it <laughs> and we might be able to do yeah. it too or something where we okay here here's the latest site we just learned this here's an announcement just for y'all to incorporate just so so we don't have to find out hard way six months later yeah so here we go um so i went to the agriculture page for example that stephanie had provided the link to and you can see um where they've got it organized by different program areas districts have so if there's a topic area by the way that um, your district does that isn't featured on here, I highly suggest getting in touch with um, with us, um, with Ryan Bay and Tom Salzar. Bill, is that something, you know, that yep. maybe Wade would want? Yeah, okay, cool with us. Um, so like for uh, water, like we have been talking about, so here you go, stormwater management. Um, you can see different programs from several different CDs. If you have a program that is not here, Make sure you get on it. <laughs> uh, it's great. The more we can have these directories um, updated and referenced, the better for all of us. So you can see all the different water programming that they have, different you know groundwater monitoring. You know these are really helpful tools that you know you can reference. They so don't have to reinvent the wheel. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> 